Okay, I think uh, we can begin. So I'm, this, this is an afternoon of two Matthews. I'm Matthew the Lesser. Matthew the Greater, giving the actual talk. So I'm Professor Matthew Hendley from the History Department, and I'm chair of the Alden Scholars uh, Series Committee. And we're very happy to uh, have Professor uh, Matt Unanks here, who's going to be giving the Alden Series talk on his newly published book, uh, Colonial Geography, um, <coughs> excuse me, Race and Space in German East Africa, 1884-1905. So I'm just going to give a few words of introduction to both our real audience here, and we also have a virtual audience of uh, SUNY alumni who are watching online. And I'd just like to tell you a little bit about the Alden Room, that is the location for our talk, a little bit about the Alden series, uh, a little bit about our speaker, and then um, a few words of instruction to our virtual audience. So uh, please be patient with me. The Alden Scholar Series lectures are held here in the Alden Room, and this is a fitting place as we celebrate books and the written word uh, from our faculty. This room is named in honor of Jessica Alden, who was a 1906 graduate of the Oneonta Normal School, which is the founding uh, school of SUNY Oneonta. And Ms. Alden returned to the Normal School uh, as our first uh, librarian, and she held this position for 30 years. Uh, within this room, you'll see there are treasures of the college, there are photographs, correspondence, publications, documenting the history of SUNY Oneonta, uh, and our special book collections, which includes a faculty publications collection. Because of the fragile nature of the collections in this room, we just ask it's important not to leave any crumbs or other things that might attract mice or other small creatures that could then bunch on the books. Uh, so we ask there will be there be no food or drink in the room. The only exception is water for the speaker. So I think that's only fair. Please notice there are comment cards all over the, the uh, chairs with uh, some extra pencils lying about. Before you leave the talk, please fill out the comment cards. It only takes a minute or so, and it gives us useful information for the organizing committee as we plan our future uh, talks. You can leave your completed cards either on the chairs themselves or there's some orange boxes um, near the round table by the entrance you can drop them into. Uh, please note there are copies of uh, Professor Gunain's books for sale after the talk. It's a hardback book published by University of Toronto Press and uh, Darren Lyons, who's the manager of business operations at OES, has kindly uh, arranged for this to occur. It's not Always easy to do that for an academic book, and he is uh, here both to listen to the talk and offer books for sale. The Alden Scholar Series itself is the result of a collaborative effort between the History Department and Milton Library. This first began in 2012, and it celebrates faculty members from our college who have published scholarly books or produced book-length projects in the last five years. I would like to thank the members of that committee, who include Meta Harder, Jennifer Jensen, Marilyn Benson, Heather Stalter, uh, Mark Ferrara, uh, and George Hovis, and also um, Sophia uh, Dunn has joined us as well. And I'd like to also thank, as I mentioned, uh, Darren Lyons, uh, Mark English, and uh, Raphael from IT. Uh, Laura Lincoln from Alumni uh, Relations to help set up the simulcast. Uh, Darren Chase from the Milne Library, uh, the director of the library for letting us use the space. And there's a very nice display that was created um, by Sophia uh, Meta and supervised by Heather Stalter uh, outside for you to look at. So our speaker today is Professor Matthew Unangst. He's been assistant professor at SUNY Oneonta since 2021. He teaches uh, courses in world history, European history, and African history. He's extremely well published for a new professor at college, as well as his first monograph. He's published articles in prestigious journals like the Journal of Global History, the Journal of Historical Geography, Central European History, and the Journal of Imperial and Commonwealth History. Uh, Dr. Ning's lecture is based on his uh, recently published book, Colonial Geography, Race and Space in German East Africa, 
1884 to 1905, and the book charts changes in the conceptions of the relationship between people and landscapes in mainland Tanzania during the German colonial period. As he will show you, in German minds, colonial development would depend on the relationship between East Africans and the landscape. And in this lecture, Dr. Unengs will demonstrate and show how spatial thinking shaped ideas about race and colonialism in the period of new imperialism for all the European empires, not just uh, Germany. If you like what you hear, I'd mention Professor Unengs has a range of excellent courses being offered in the fall, including a course called Nation and Race, another one on the history of the Holocaust, and he is the um, supervisor of a course that leads to the publication of the uh, first history undergraduate journal we have had in many years at the college. So we will begin shortly, but just a shout out to our virtual audience. If you're an attendee joining us online, uh, please turn on the optional closed captions. You can hover your mouse over the screen and click on the gearbox at the bottom right. And then you will pop up with the option captions or subtitles and you can use this to turn on English or Spanish translated closed captions. Please note if you do the closed caption option there is a slight 10 to uh, 20 second delay until the captions begin. Please note that at the end of this talk we will have a question and answer and we invite the audience to ask questions. The online attendees can also submit questions by using the Q&A feature in Teams, and the questions will be held until after the lecture and then will be moderated um, and given to our presenter. So that's more than enough for me, so I'd like to welcome Professor Unengs, and we'll be very interested to hear uh, from his book, <clears throat> All About Race and Space in Germany, East Africa. Thank you, Matthew, and thank you especially to the rest of the Alden Scholar Series Committee for organizing this. Uh, there was a whole lot of work put in that I didn't have any part of, um, and I appreciate that. As well as a thank you to everyone here in person today and online. Um, so as Matthew mentioned, my talk today is drawn from my book, Colonial Geography, Race and Space in German East Africa published last year by the University of Toronto Press. In the second half of the 1880s, Europeans fixed their attention on Eastern Africa. What helped so many people wrapped was the fantastical story of one man, Emin Pasha. Emin's name and title belied his origins. He had been born Eduard Schnitzer in Obel, Prussia in 1845. After completing medical school, Schnitzer traveled south, where he hoped to enter the service of the Ottoman Empire. Emin's interest in the Ottomans was part of the wider German obsession with the Orient and Empire in the 19th century. At the time, Germany was not unified as a country, and there were no German colonies. So service to the Ottomans served as an outlet that someone in Britain or France would have sought in India or Algeria instead. To make communication easier, he claimed, Schnitzer took on an identity as a Turk who had been educated in Germany, explaining his German accent, though it doesn't seem like he actually fooled anyone. He moved to Cairo and entered the service of the Egyptian government, eventually winding his way down to Khartoum in Sudan in 1875. It was while he was in Khartoum that he took on this new name, Mohammed Emin. From there, he began building a reputation in Europe as a naturalist. He corresponded with British and German scholars, collecting plants and animals, especially birds, and sending them to European museums. He becomes the collector of the fauna from this area. In fact, there are over 200 specimens in the American Museum of Natural History in New York that were originally collected by Emin, mostly bought from German museums after the First World War. Emin's reputation as a naturalist and a linguist came to the attention of Charles Gordon, then governor of Equatoria. Equatoria was an Egyptian province that was part of what is now South Sudan and Northern Uganda. 
and its officials held posts under the authority of the Egyptian Khedive. Gordon hired Emin onto his staff as chief medical officer in 1876. When Gordon was then promoted to governor of the whole Sudan in 1878, the Khedive appointed Emin to succeed Gordon as governor in Equatoria. With the Samaniya religious and political leader, Muhammad Ahmad, better known in Europe as the Mahdi, attacked the Sudan, took Khartoum, and killed Gordon in 1885, he cut Emin off from contact from Europe. The Austrian explorer, Wilhelm Juncker, brought Emin's case to light. Juncker had spent several months with Emin in Wadalai, the Equatorian capital. After escaping to Zanzibar and returning to Europe, Juncker lectured across Germany on his and Emin's work in late 1886. He told audiences, quote, the work of a hundred years of civilization was at stake, end quote, if Emin was not rescued. The news of Emin's survival became popular because of his connection to Gordon. Gordon's death, provoked memorialization verging on hagiography, poems, monuments, paintings, biographies, but Europeans initially paid little attention to Emin. When news of Emin arrived through Juncker, Gordon's death was still in the public consciousness. The fact that one of his lieutenants was still alive and asking for help captured imaginations across the continent. Geographical societies made Emin an honorary member. Children made up songs in the streets of Germany about him, and he became a, a figure of popular legend. Popular support for a rescue expedition rose, even as both the British and Egyptian governments lost all interest in Equatoria, which was threatened with an invasion by the Kingdom of Uganda to its south. The relative lack of information about Emin was part of his appeal to metropolitan Europeans, as it meant his story could more easily be molded for political purposes. As the British standard put it, so much mystery, or if the word be preferred, so much romance surrounds the sturdy Teuton, that the thought of succoring him may well appeal to the imaginative side of the German temperament. The only Germans who had had contact with Emin, however, were naturalists to whom he had sent plant and animal sam samples. Several of these scientific colleagues, both German and British, put together a collection of Emin's letters with commentary in German and English. Among the editors was the geographer Friedrich Ratzel who wrote glowingly of Emin's help with his understanding of what he considered primitive cultures. But the main means of communication about Emin was maps, which could show a part of the world about which most Europeans knew little, and could be designed to heighten a sense of danger to Equatoria. So the map on the left here is showing Emin's birthplace to Khartoum, this great distance he traveled, and then on the right, a uh, map of his province. These maps are extremely common in the press at the time. Public enthusiasm to rescue Emin produced action first in the United Kingdom, where Henry Morton Stanley, renowned as the greatest explorer of the time, perhaps the most famous man in the world, put together a massive expedition to bring Emin out of Equatoria and to Britain. It left Britain in 1886. The map on the right-hand side is this Henry Morton Stanley expedition. It provoked concerns among German colonialists that it was a threat to the German colony in East Africa. Karl Peters, the head of the German East Africa Company, which I'll refer to by its German acronym, the DOAG, finagled a meeting with Chancellor Otto von Bismarck. Peters used maps to communicate, drawing for the Chancellor a picture of a threat to German interests should Equatoria become a British colony. In response, 
Bismarck offered his famous quip, my map of Africa is in Europe, as he rejected government support for a German counter. The painters communicated with the map is indicative of the role that maps played in the new imperialism of the late 19th and early 20th century. Maps became the most widespread and powerful assertions of European states' authority over colonial empires. Imperial maps turn colonial spaces into recognizable images for European consumption. Maps provided a visual representation of the superiority of Europeans and individual European nations as imperial powers. They staged colonial authority for European audiences, asserting European sovereignty and superiority over distant people and places where claims tr to traditional authority were difficult to establish. They proposed clear-cut visions of European dominance over extra-European spaces and peoples, concealing the contested nature of authority on the ground. They sanitized the racism and violence of empire and turned it into a contest of national glory. This is well established that many scholars have written about the role of maps and empires. I argue in my book that the power of geography was not only in maps, that the German colonial empire enjoyed an especially tight link with geography more broadly as a discipline. Indeed, what distinguished German colonialism from that of other European powers was the role of cultural geography in the German civilizing mission. The justification for Germans to remake African societies in the name of progress. Cultural geographers, broadly um, grouped, posited connections between the characteristics of physical spaces and the racial characteristics of the societies that inhabited them. That race and space were intricately linked and the development of one meant development of the other. Over the last few decades, there has been increasing attention to the German colonial empire, which was short-lived from only the 1880s until the First World War. Um, the scholarship has focused on connections between the violence of German imperialism in Africa before the First World War and German imperialism in Eastern Europe during the Second World War. I argue in contrast that the most important element in German imperialism was not its violence, but its attempts to apply racial thinking to the mastery and control of space. So some background on German East Africa. I chart changes in how Germans conceptualized race and space from the founding of this colony in 1884 when mainland Tanzania, together with Rwanda and Burundi, became German East Africa, which remained a German colony until 1918, the end of the war. I trace the evolution of German ideas about space here, from a belief that simply possessing and cultivating the land would suffice to make it German, to a belief that it was necessary to transform the land by reshaping its people. As a result of a series of crises, Germanizing East Africa increasingly came to mean manipulating the racial characteristics of the colony's people, and even importing new people to the colony, as we'll see. The methods to do this changed over time, in the 1880s, the colony's private founders imagined they could simply take territory, claim it was German, and it would become German. This is an empire as drawn completely on a map, with little thought given to the workings of the colonial state, um, something typical of European colonies created in the scramble for Africa. German territory, in this vision, would in turn Germanize its inhabitants, who would create agriculture following German models. After challenges to private colonial rule, the German government assumed control of the colony, 
The 1890s were characterized by tensions between the prior belief that successful colonialism depended on making territory German and growing calls for making use of the perceived racial characteristics of the colony's population. With this, we see a shift toward cultural geography as the framework for understanding the colony and its development. Mirroring wider intellectual trends that began in Germany and spread to other parts of the world. These visions became dominant after the turn of the century as German administrators attempted to accelerate processes of African social and economic evolution. In the new model, African agriculturalists who had become more like Germans would make landscapes more German rather than Germans doing this themselves. The series of failed projects carried out from 1884 to 1918 were the first German state project to manipulate race to manage territory. They did not, however, unfold without contestation. African actors continued to make space on terms not controlled by Germans and reshape German projects to other ends. There were frequently tensions between state projects to create borders between political and economic units, often defined in ethnic terms, and spatial imaginaries on the ground based in networks connecting people across space. The result was a hybrid geography that combined European, African, and Indian Ocean ideas, which Germans used to claim territorial sovereignty based on race as the primary factor in East African history. These geographies became the basis of state-directed development in Germany from this point forward, managing race and space in tandem. So how I got into this project was thinking about the ways in which global geographic categories, meta geographies, become concrete facts on the ground. So how are big narratives about world history and geography become part of how we actually live in the world? I got into this topic in the wake of my graduate exams, thinking about regionalization. Why is my scholarship on Europe and Africa so different? And in this case, not just Europe and Africa. There's also significant differences between the study of mainland Tanzania and the Indian Ocean world to which it's linked. And so I began with a research question about the encounter of much different ideas about space and history in East Africa. Um, German East Africa chosen because it's Germany's most important colony economically, the amount that people are talking about it in the 19th century, but also because East Africa has long been a zone of interaction of people from many different regions of the world, diverse groups of people converging, trying to make sense of and control environments, and because it's already been part of discussions of rethinking world geographies in scholarship in the Indian Ocean world. And so as I looked at developments in East Africa using the different sources here, state sources in both Germany and Tanzania, um, missionary sources, sources written by geographers, various organization records, I started to see more and more of this adoption of this framework from cultural geography as something that came out of these sources. I mean, although I'm here focused on Germany and East Africa, in some ways this is a unique story, but in a lot of ways is something that is a broader story of imperialism in this era. German cultural geography is enormously influential in the rest of Europe and the United States. Um, so in addition to the Amin Pasha story that I started with, that we'll return to in a bit, I'm gonna discuss two cases from the book. One from the mid 1880s 
the other from the start of the 20th century to trace the evolution of geography's role in German East Africa. This first case will be an intellectual history, a transition from physical geography to economic geography, where we're going to see the development of new historical narratives to demand control of territory. We'll then look at the specific example of practice rather than intellectual history that became the basis of German development thinking in the early 20th century, which involved the importation of workers from Sri Lanka to remake African space. So this first case from the 1880s examines the development of the concept of hinterland in East Africa in the 1880s. This idea of hinterland has become popular in scholarship on various maritime worlds over the last few decades. The Mediterranean world, the Indian Ocean world, and on and on. Um, hinterland in the scholarship serves as a shorthand to describe an area that is economically connected to a port. The area that sends exports through that port and receives imports through it. So this links continents to these maritime spaces, that you don't just have the Indian Ocean world as the actual ocean, but also all of these areas on continents link to it economically. Um, and hinterland is a word that is German, but entered English and French in the late 1880s with this meaning of these economic connections. So it's an economic geographic concept. Um, this is an excerpt from a book. This is a fourth edition. The first edition of this is published in the 1880s by this guy, George Chisholm, who brings the word into English. This is from his um, dictionary of economic geography um, here that this concept is this economic concept. Um, so a number of scholars have adopted this as a way of undermining European geographical categories. The idea of an Indian Ocean world as an economic, political, and cultural space predating European expansion, possibly back to the last century before the birth of Christ, offers a possible antidote to the geographical projects of European imperialism. But, I argue in the book, this obscures the idea's imperial origins and its role in the creation of territorial empires. In fact, this whole idea and history of an Indian Ocean world begins as a justification for German conquest. So the first place before hinterland enters English, where we see the use of this concept in relation to Africa was in discussions that came out of the Berlin Conference of 1884-85. The conference that often appears in textbook accounts as the beginning of the scramble for Africa. So you've probably all seen um, versions of the map on the left, probably not in German, but you get the general idea of this division of the continent by the European powers. The map on the right is a map from the conference itself, the Berlin Conference of 1884-1885, drawn up at the time as the countries at the conference are trying to determine borders before they've settled on the map on the left. And it's in this map on the right that we can see what the Germans called at the time the hinterland theory. As German diplomats argued this, the theory was that a nation's colonial claims on a coast should extend into the interior of Africa along the same lines of latitude. Hinter just means behind in German, so this was the area physically behind the coast, if you're looking at it from the water. This, of course, is not a new concept in the 1880s. You may have seen maps of U.S. westward expansion and the extension of state borders in early maps that just stretched pretty much until 
who knows what was there at the time. Um, it's really an idea of territorial sovereignty. You just mark a map with some lines along these scientifically drawn lines of latitude, an entirely physical geography that takes no account of African claims, African societies, and African politics at all. And this is indicative of this era of imperialism, people in European capitals drawing lines on maps to determine control of territory. But of course, the reality was far more complicated. The goal of European states was to create clearly bordered sovereignty, no matter the facts on the ground. This is a detail from a map of German East Africa in 1886. You can see a sphere of influence from Berlin in lines drawn. The red line at the top is a line agreed to in Berlin in 1884, you've got it. But there are also some oddities on this map. First, the other weird shaped red outline. This is the territory claimed by the German East Africa Company, the DOAG. It has round borders. Uh, we can clearly see this desire to create borders, draw them on the map, no matter how absurd they are. Clearly, there are some points on this map where someone has simply put a compass down and drawn a circle around the point to determine this is ours. There's also something else weird about this map, which is kind of hard to see on the slide, but the area right along the coast is yellow. The yellow here is Zanzibari territory. Zanzibar, um, with its capital on the larger of the islands you see just off the coast, had signed international agreements with the UK and France that recognized its control of the coast. So here, this is territory that foreign powers have agreed that it belongs to Zanzibar. In negotiations with Britain and France over the extent of this territory, how far it would stretch west, the German government argued that the hinterland theory shouldn't apply to Zanzibar, right? that hinterland theory should call for everything to the west of this to go to the country that controls the coast, Zanzibar. But Zanzibar hadn't been invited to the Berlin Conference. Its sultans had never tried to colonize like European nations did, and had not really tried to extend formal authority beyond the, path, the coast. For the German argument, Zanzibari sultans had not created tax or legal systems in the interior which they claimed was the true mark of sovereignty. And so German colonists simply fit this into a narrative of the Zanzibaris not really knowing what they're doing. Um, and so they claim the area farther west. But the German project to the west didn't really work. I mean, part of the problem was that Ideas about this space differed greatly on the ground from what Germans were saying. Um, here we have a map from Pesa Mbili. Pesa Mbili was a caravan headman in East Africa in the early 20th century. This is him drawing a, a map of his route between the town of Mikindani, which over here on the coast, the route wraps around here, around the edge, to finally end in what's now Bujumbura, far in the interior. This is a distance as the crow flies of over 800 miles that he's drawn on this map. So clearly for Pesa and Billy, the idea that the map needs to follow that scientific system of latitude and longitude doesn't apply. Right? North, there is no north, south, east, and west on this map. What matters for him is the connections, the networks between different places that he's traveled to. Can show you this route. He's been on it many times. Within the individual towns, each of these collections of shapes are towns that he stopped in. We have different types of structures 
Some of them have flagpoles. Right? For him, what matters is connections rather than borders. And this is generally the idea about space that exists in East Africa when the Germans show up. That connections matter, the in-between doesn't matter so much. Where political borders are don't matter so much. And the fact that he draws this 20 years later, after the Germans have been there, is proof that the Germans don't get rid of these ideas too. These ideas continue, continue to exist alongside these German ideas about space. <clears throat> Um, the first three years of German rule through 1887 demonstrate the limitations of the geographies and urban and economic models of European colonialism in the late 19th century in their incompatibility with local geographies. Colonial hinterlands were supposed to produce products for export through ports controlled by the colonial power. In East Africa, however, Zanzibar controlled these ports, meaning it charged customs, made money off these exports of products from the German hinterland. And so the DLAG hemorrhaged money, 1886-87, leading the head of the organization, Karl Peters, to declare that the owner of the coast was naturally sovereign of the entire hinterland in times of, <coughs> in terms of trade, um, using again a physical geographic explanation of the problem. Other members of the German colonial movement were more creative in their solutions. Here we see the reformulation of the concept of hinterland from this purely physical relationship of areas behind the coast to an economic relationship. And in order to make this argument, a number of members of the colonial lobby develop narratives of Indian Ocean world history. In 1887, we see the beginnings of the definition of hinterland as an economic concept the definition that we still have today. Um, and in this, they deployed expertise. Social scientists especially were valuable in supporting this project. Um, a couple of important people involved, Friedrich Hummacher, who's an activist for colonialism, on a lecture tour across Germany, told audiences that East Africa had once traded with Greece and Rome, but with the fall of the Roman Empire, it had slipped out of the European orbit and become part of an Indian Ocean world through the migration of Arabs to East Africa and East African troops to Baghdad. Renowned Egyptologist Heinrich Bruch declared that Hamitic peoples had traveled to East Africa centuries before. There, their superior knowledge of shipbuilding and construction allowed them to become, quote, leaders and teachers in the hinterlands of the East African coast. Such narratives of East African history made the connection between coast and hinterland appear natural. This economic relationship that supersedes any kind of physical relationship. This economic model of hinterland and coast becomes the basis for the German government to negotiate for control of the coast as part of a bounded territory. Political pressure and threats from the German Navy forced the Sultan of Zanzibar, Khalifa bin Said, to make over all of his power on the mainland. The West was now completely free for German expansion. Otto Arendt, a member of the German Reichstag, who was a major supporter of colonialism, declared the German territory had now reached its natural borders. Germany had a closed off important territory on the Indian Ocean with the most consequential precondition for its prospering, unhindered access to the coast now available. But problems continue. This vision of geography created in the 1880s was still static. 
and didn't recognize African agency. The goal of taking control of the coast was to control trade, but coastal merchants simply adapted, changing their connections to the hinterland to escape German control. So when German administrators instituted a pass system to regulate and tax the caravan trade, many merchants moved their operations north to the British sphere of interest, what's now Kenya, or south to what's now Mozambique, controlled by Portugal. Porters increasingly traveled the short journey to Zanzibar rather than looking for work on the German coast, and German businesses complained to the government about this. In 1895, a German official in one town complained that 80% of the town's trade in ivory had moved to Mombasa in Kenya. Merchants simply didn't think of the hinterland as belonging to one particular coast, but transported goods to Indian Ocean networks by whatever means made the most economic sense. Among societies in the interior, the project also faced difficulties. The German administration divided the coast from the interior in its form of administration. Areas on the coast were controlled by civilian administrators, while areas inland in the extended hinterland were subject to military administration. Local leaders called Jumbes largely ignored these boundaries unless they were forced to observe them. German administrators no noted frequent cases of Jumbes in one district asserting authority over parts of other districts well into the 20th century. Many chose to live on the side of a military district where taxes were lower while maintaining their fields and authority in the civilian district. Tax evasion, even back then. They continued their dealings with caravans along the same lines as before German arrival, charging tolls and conducting their own trade. And so these natural borders of East Africa did not unify the colony into one economy. This economic hinterland was as illusory as the physical one, in fact. And this is a tax map from the time of who's paid their taxes and whether they paid in cash or in kind. <coughs> the limited German efforts to think through an alternative focused on technological solutions, not people. Reading the history of the expansion of the U.S. West, some Germans imagined railway construction as the solution. But railway construction didn't solve problems either. First, railways were extremely expensive, meaning that construction was halting. Second, construction of a British railway from Mombasa to Uganda was farther along. This idea that railways were the answer, however, does demonstrate that most German colonialists were still unable to imagine Africans as anything other than labor and not as autonomous economic actors. This brings us back to Emin Pasha. Supporters of the rescue expedition argued that Emin could personally develop, deliver more territory to Germany expanding the possibilities of economic growth, including the extension of a railway there. The DOAG wrote to Bismarck that Stanley's true goal was the acquisition of territory west of its sphere of interest, forming a dam against the development of a German Africa. It threatened to send its own expeditions to the region to acquire more territory. The German Foreign Office took this letter seriously enough to request assurances from the British government, which the latter provided in July 1887. And so the Stanley expedition turned uncertainty about the position of one man into, in Equatoria into confusion about colonial rivalries and the long-term future of Central Africa. The campaign to rescue Evan became central to the colonialist movement in the late 1880s and was formative for right-wing populist mobilization, even as the expedition itself appealed to Germans across the political spectrum. While some Germans remained stuck on arguments about physical geography alone, others adopted a historical argument for German expansion. 
In this argument, Emmons Germans was transforming the space around him in Equatoria. Its adherents imagined the enemy of the German presence as Islam. Europeans at the time were often unable to think beyond race, so Muslim was often conflated with Arab in their arguments. And rhetoric around the expedition reveals the German imaginary as a struggle for European and German civilization in Africa against the influence of Islam, which Germans claimed was backwards and barbaric. Histories of Arab slavery were especially prominent. So here we have a map of the supposed Arab slave trade in Africa in the 1880s, much of it also fantastical as Germans imagined it. Um, but with Emin, we get the emergence of this idea that a German man, German science, could make a profitable colony through simply their Germanness. And the idea that enslavement these caravan routes are spaces that needed German intervention. So the German expedition to rescue Evan unfolded against government wishes. The German government tried to stop this um, if they failed, but they were also more concerned with other things. People on the Indian Ocean coast took up arms against the actions of German officers prompting Bismarck to send a military expedition and have Germany take formal control of the colony from the private German East Africa Company. Although the government and the company had different goals, they both adopted the idea of a struggle between European Christians and Muslim Arabs, justifying German conquest as an anti-slave trade measure. But from this point, the German project was now directed by the government with far more resources, far more military strength behind it. So Germans could imagine themselves as the bearers of progress, but how did this translate into spatial transformation? Through much of the 1890s, as trade continued to move north, the German government and private colonialists attempted to create plantation agriculture for export. They were unsuccessful, and so this next case examines the return to more radical needs of remaking East African spaces and races after the turn of the 20th century, means that explicitly drew on the work of cultural geographers. Um, the work of Friedrich Rossel, in particular, became formative in the creation of the German administration. Rossel's book, Lebensraum, today primarily discussed in terms of its connections to National Socialism, did not explicitly address German expansion. Instead, Rotzel's argument was that the Darwinian struggle for existence was really a struggle for space, and that in order to win this struggle, races were fighting against each other, um, so the weaker ones were slowly disappearing, and this prodded Germans to introduce an element of time into their conceptions of space. And although Russell's argument was about natural processes, administrators believed they could manage the changes. Administrators tried to speed up this process through the management of race in the colony, using what they perceived as racial characteristics to transform territory. This map is of the whole colony. The focus here is on the region of Usambara in the Northeast, which German colonial propagandists promoted as a future German India, a region that would make the colony as a whole profitable. But in the 1890s, successive rinderpest and smallpox epidemics decimated the population. And as things stood, work in the district was almost all done by Sukuma migrants from the northwest of the colony, who returned home after just a few months working on plantations. Ludwig Meyer, the district official for Tonga, of which Usambara was a part, 
wrote Governor Gustav von Goodson that he wanted Indian settlers in his district to make Usambara like India. Usambara was fruitful, but its people did not produce enough food to even feed themselves, Meyer claimed. Superior forms of cultivation were needed to make the land more productive. In the German imaginary, the gap between Europeans and Africans was too large to be bridged. And for Meyer, then, what was needed was a group of people who, in his words, were half cultured to bridge this gap and improve African agricultural techniques. Indian farmers, he claimed, would show the Sukuma migrants how settled agriculture could create value and become the kernel of a larger colony. At this time, the German government refused entry to European settlers if they could not support themselves based on the idea that Europeans couldn't live in tropical climates. But Meyer offered to front the money for Indian settlement. Goodson, the governor, approved this plan, writing to his superiors in the Foreign Office that the colony could only become valuable if its African inhabitants saw the economic superiority of, quote, colored cultured races, end quote, and changed their own methods. The East African administration decided that the best source of these Indian farmers would be Sri Lanka on the advice of John Hagenbeck, a German planter there. This, of course, indicates the reductive racial thinking of Europeans in this period, where broad categories suffice to define groups of people. Hagenbeck suggests recruiting families who had worked as paid laborers in rice farming for the British and offering land and tax incentives to convince them to settle in East Africa. Together with the German consul, Walter Freudenberg, he recruited 90 Sinhalese farmers to move, and they were on their way to Tonga by February 1902. At the same time, the district administration in Tonga settled several hundred Nyamwezi farmers in the district, people from the northwest of the colony to be the group that would learn from the Sri Lankans. Meyer thought that they would provide day labor in the meantime and learn to be like the Sri Lankan farmers over time. He moved uh, Nyamwezi Jumbe to a place near Tonga, um, paying for a village to be built there. Other Nyamwezi moved on their own accord. So the migrants arrived from Sri Lanka in late February. By March 9th, almost all of them wanted to go home. 16 of the men signed on as contract workers, but the other 74 decided to go back. Many had become sick, others feared the animals that were in East Africa. The 16 who remained seemingly disproved claims that people could simply impart their racial characteristics to the soil. The cattle of the settlement fell ill, fell Ill with Texas fever, and the Sinhalese farmers struggled to manage the work of farming in the region. Meyer estimated that they required as many African workers as there were settlers in order to operate the farms. To ensure that they would be what he called a better model, Meyer replaced their primitive farm equipment with the latest German plows, harrows, and seeding machines. So to turn what he thought was a half-cultured race into a model for what he called natural people, Meyer required this expensive machinery that the Nyamwezi farmers would never have the means to acquire. But he was determined to make Rotzel's theory of cultural diffusion work in his district, even if it required government intervention. And so with this, we can see a shift in adaptations of cultural geography after the turn of the century. A shift to an active role for governments in changing racial characteristics. And so by the start of the 20th century, the colonial government, with support from Berlin, was trying to apply racial thinking to developed space. 
To sum up, ideas about empire around the turn of the 20th century tightly linked ideas about race and space. Imperialism was fundamentally about the control of territory and labor. Cultural geography provided the means to link the two. It provided the justification for Europeans to take control of territory and people they saw as behind in time. And as Germans saw it, changing either people or landscapes could change both to produce economic development for the colonizer's benefit. State intervention into a supposedly natural, biological, and historical process became an appealing way to make colonialism profitable and laid the groundwork for other such innovations. It provided a framework and rationale for states to manage race, which would shape the rest of the 20th century. German cultural geography spread to the US, became the basis of the discipline here, and the idea that progress had to be speeded up, that state projects that denied local knowledge, but which used the perceived racial characteristics of the population, could accelerate it, became increasingly common in empires in Africa and Europe in the following decades. Thank you all for listening. Thank you. Okay, that's great. So thank you so much, um, Professor Unes. This is the period in which we'll entertain some uh, questions um, for Professor Unes. We have a reception afterwards, so please don't um, miss that. Uh, we have real people here, and I guess equally real people, mostly, but they're uh, not physically here. Um, so I wonder if the, the people that are here in person would like to begin with some uh, questions for Professor Hanks, and then we'll see if there's any online questions as well. Um, so I would say, um, like, what made you decide to study this particular area um, during East Africa? Because, like, I wasn't familiar with that area by that title. So when I looked it up, I was familiar with more of like the tribes that are actually there, like Rwanda and Belgium and stuff like that. And um, like from my personal understanding, all I really was aware of like the genocide, like the horrific genocide that took place there and like why, you know, economically why those things happened. Um, so I was very interested to hear like this different perspective as far as geography. I mean, we're aware that that's happened here in the U.S. given like redlining and stuff like that. So we know like geography is used in relation with race to, you know, control space. But yeah, I just really want to know why this area. Yeah, so, so a couple of reasons. One is that this has long been this region of encounter uh, that because of the amount of trade in the Indian Ocean. So these towns along the coast, let me go back to a map that shows this somewhat. Yeah, so this map here in the top right is of trade networks in the Indian Ocean. That a lot of these trade networks date back over a thousand years. And so, there's this long-term contact and cultural mixing that's happening long before Europeans show up. So, for instance, the Swahili language is an African language, but with a bunch of words, concepts brought in from Arabic, from Hindi, other South Asian languages that indicate that it's the language of a culture where people are not just tied to one place, but a cultural world that's a whole lot broader. Europeans go to Africa with a very narrow idea in their mind right, of what Africa is, who Africans are. This doesn't fit that model, right? We have instead people who are a whole lot more worldly and cosmopolitan than the Germans who, are, who think of themselves as bringing that. And so I wanted to see what would happen with these ideas in that encounter. Like what happens with these ideas about race, about territory, when Europeans show up somewhere where 
it can't work. And it's this process is them trying to figure out some way of making it work, some way of trying to explain and be in control. Very much right. Colonialism is about control, making whatever society it is fit the European model. And they go through these different attempts to do so. Um, so it's, I think, wound up at it with studied German history. Also, when I took African history as an undergrad, my interest was drawn to that Swahili coast interaction before, so kind of brought those two together. Thank you. So great first question. Some more questions. <laughs> great thought provoking. The other questions from our group here. I have a question. How did they how did they impart their will? It seems with economic sanctions or with that they didn't have force? Like how were they just coming in and proclaiming we're gonna make these changes? It's it's force. It's yeah. it's violence that's underlying the whole thing. Um, so they had the backing of German armies or just local? So they don't initially. That is this private company that shows up and is initially partly because there are people who are mad at Zanzibar. Right? And so they come, the Germans show up and are there to play off against Zanzibar in local politics. Okay. But that doesn't last long because the Germans are violent, are trying to exploit people. And so there's a rebellion in 1888 that then the German government takes it over and they have German troops there who basically this whole time from 1884 until 1907, there's at least one German military expedition marching around attacking people who are not following their rules, which culminates in a war from 1905 to 1907 called the Maji Maji War where the Germans kill hundreds of thousands of people um, because they're convinced there's a conspiracy against them. But it's just, it's extreme violence okay. at all times. All right. Thanks. Okay, Susan. So how, how do women in these areas interact? How, what, what's the story here? Is this violence, is this continued directed specifically at women in different ways or are women how are women supporting or not what how is that happening what's the gender piece of this yeah the violence is there against women as well as men although more is directed against men um, but for instance on these caravan routes there are large groups of women who are along on these trips as well, who get kind of written out of that European story because they're sort of blind to what people are actually doing. But there are people, there are women, men, sometimes entire families that are on these marches and are part of these networks. Um, in terms of those German ideas, the Germans are, very concerned with race mixing as they think of it. So this guy, Carl Peters, who is the, the inspiration for the German colony, murders a bunch of people, gets away with it. What gets him into trouble is the fact that he has um, a woman living with him who is an African woman and the government freaks out, Germans freak out, and that ruins his career. But up until that point, whatever he does can get away with it. Um, there's, I mean, this, so for instance, the, the settlement of the Sri Lankans is entire families is the idea, but none of the women stay. The women all leave, and it's these 16 men who remain. With that idea of agriculture, the Germans are really into the idea of settled individual farmers because that's what they think exists in Germany, which it doesn't even there. It's kind of made up. Um, 
but they want to have these individual farming families that are there. And so we'll bring whole families, but the women are mostly left out of the accounts mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. We, we have an online question. I think um, Jennifer Jansen, who's uh, part of the committee, librarian here, is supervising the remote. She was going to read the question through the speaker for you. Hi, everybody. Uh, we have a question from Maddie Schneider online. She says, can everyone hear me OK? Yes. Yep. Okay, yes. great. <laughs> Did the African victory of the Battle of Adwa of 1896 change German attitudes toward their method of colonialism? And was there a sense of threat? Not that I've seen any changes there. Um, there are not really, I mean, it's partly the Germans think of themselves as the military masters of everything. That there's a certain degree of, so the Battle of Adwa is a battle where Italy tries to invade Ethiopia, but the Ethiopian army defeats them, robs them, the Italians give up, and Ethiopia stays independent. Um, the Germans kind of think of themselves as so much better militarily than the Italians that they're not that concerned about it. So I haven't noticed or didn't notice any shift after that battle in how they're talking about things. I'm sure there are elements of that, that the defeat in Adwa creates a fair amount of panic among Europeans that they may not be able to just march all across Africa the way they want. Um, and that does probably creep into how the Germans are thinking, makes them more liable to turn to violence immediately than before. But I didn't see any explicit discussions of it, nor a real watershed where things are significantly different, obviously, from that point. We have any other online questions? Not yet. Okay. Are there any other questions in the in the room here? From anyone? Got a question. You mentioned that this uh, have this uh, mile went through like 1918 and World War One. So, what happened after that? Um, when the when Germany was losing the World War One, so were there any changes? So, in this colony becomes British. And his long, complicated story of is not technically a colony, is under the control of the League of Nations, but for the most functional part is just the British colony. So the British bring their own ideas and methods that they've developed <laughs> elsewhere. The Germans who are involved wind up back in Germany, most of them. And they're then part of thinking about German expansion later on. So these ideas wind up after 1918 having a bigger effect in Europe as the Germans are expanding in the 30s and 40s than they do in East Africa, where you really get that break. Can I ask a question? <laughs> I mean, you're the... <laughs> <laughs> the other guy. Because, I mean, just to, to lead on from what you were saying, I mean, one of the titles of your works had the rather um, disturbing title of Layman's Ground, which, of course, is a, you know, a well-applied Nazi idea of a justification for imperialism into Eastern Europe and the subjugation of the Slavs and extermination of the so-called lesser races. So, how much of a direct line? I mean, how many of these guys who are writing these rather abstract, you know, concepts about drawing lines on the African map and controlling space then become ardent, you know, Nazis who then actually implement some of this stuff in real time in Europe or else their protégés? I mean, is there really a direct line or is it more like a, you know, cloud of influence that other people misread and then I'll do that so there are some people who wind up in important positions under the Nazis. 
but I really think it's more of the intellectual ideas that have the influence than the people who shape things. So for instance, that book, Laban's Realm, which is then often used to explain Nazi expansion, that the first place we can see that being used as a concept is in East Africa. That that's where it's first brought in and then goes through various forms of evolution in between before the Nazis start expanding. But is part of the development of that from this abstract geographical concept, which as I mentioned in Russell's book, isn't about human beings primarily. He uses this Laban's realm is also a battle between species of plants, species of animals, but that all existence should be understood as a struggle for space. That space was the one finite thing that you could never create more of, and so there would be this struggle for it. And so with that, we get then people for the first time reading that, then you know, oh yeah, let's try that out. And, or let's apply our resources to making sure that happens the way we want it to happen. That then becomes a more explicit ideology of the German people must have more space in the 30s. Um, just a quick off of the question about like after World War One, um, I think you had mentioned, I think it was on your website that, you know, after German loses World War I, um, the technological advances kind of just halt and they stop and, you know, what I'm thinking is like what happens with the progress or whatever that was happening in East Africa, what happens with all those developments because you kind of mentioned like there was nothing on the land before, but I wonder like maybe they probably would have been better off before colonial influence and would have developed naturally rather than someone coming in, introducing a bunch of ideas and then just leaving it to be and now it's kind of like this like just degrading happening, you know? Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> I just, I just, I that's, it, yeah. that's a long-standing discussion in African history. It is that how to understand this period where like, Europeans are bringing those new technologies, the railway especially, but also of course really destructive technologies are bringing in weapons that can kill a whole lot more people than anything that was there before. They're bringing in schools, they're bringing in hospitals, but most people aren't actually seeing an improvement in their quality of life. These railways aren't built to help people get around. They're built really to connect economic regions where there are European financial interests. The argument is over how much of this is intentional by Europeans and how much of it is just they don't care. Um, and there's arguments on both sides of it. But but yeah, they're not. I would say the quality of life in Tanzania in 1915 is worse on average than it was 30 years earlier, 40 years earlier. Um, but people lose more than they gain. And there are, there are individuals who really benefit from it. Um, Africans who are able to find a place in the system and use the system to their advantage, but in, on the whole is not an improvement in people's lives. Any uh, other questions? Mark I have one last question. <laughs> um, because I, I, I'm not an expert on it, but I know a bit about the, the British experience in Africa. And one thing seems sort of missing in, in this vision that Germans have put forward is the idea of settlement of Germans and setting in Germans to you know build their farms and you know develop forests. And the, you know, the British were very interested in certain areas of Africa, Kenya especially, as a you know potential recreation of a Europe. European stuff settlement by Europeans. So did that ever enter into their equation or did they just feel for geographic, climactic 
quote, racial reasons that Germans could not themselves thrive in East Africa. It does for a time, but the German government is paranoid about socialism. And there are major concerns that if they start letting Germans move to East Africa, the Germans who are going to want to move are the ones who are down and out, who are going to bring socialism there. And so they want to keep the colonies free of socialism. So there are limits where if you have a lot of money, enough startup capital that you can afford a big chunk of land to pay all your costs for a couple of years, you're welcome. But people who do not have very much money are not allowed to move, are barred by the government, which is gets into a long discussion of German politics in the 1890s, early 20th century. There is an attempt to bring Boers from South Africa, these descendants of the Dutch settlers there, that the Germans think they're more prepared to be in African climates than Germans are. That turns into a disaster because um, the Boers don't do what the government wants them to do. Are, I don't know if they're more violent or differently violent toward Africans than the government is. And after that goes on for a couple of years, they decide that they shouldn't allow any more Boers in. Yeah. Okay, I had no idea. That's really weird. <laughs> uh, interesting. Okay, so are there any other questions? Okay, well, if not, I'd like to extend our thanks to, uh, from all to Professor Gunings, and we have a reception afterwards. If you have further questions, need some sustenance. So thank you very much for uh, coming out on this snowy afternoon to learn all about uh, Germany Sound. Thank you. <laughs> I'm happy to answer questions from anyone who didn't want to ask in front of everybody. <laughs> and we, if anyone wants to leave credit, there is, I think, a QR printout that can be scanned that Sophia has here. And please uh, fill out your comment cards and we have an orange box. Right, just go. Uh, <laughs>